Welcome everyone. Once again, let's talk about social inclusion. And today we ask, what is an inclusive city? And how do we create one? And so I've invited uh, Karine Duplin that um, we invited Karine Duplin to help us explain, to answer the question, and to explore the concept of inclusive city for gender and sexual minorities. This will be the focus of our conversation today. And we will explore um, targeted publics of inclusive policies concerning gender and sexual sexualities, and also to understand how participation reshapes urban citizenship and what are the implications for social justice. Karine, welcome to our episode. Thank you. Karine, why did you decide to conduct research uh, uh, inclusion in cities of sexual and gender minorities? Um, so I decided to explore this, uh, the use of uh, inclusive terminology in public policy because um, inclusion seems self-evident. Um, uh, who can say he or she is against inclusion? Or if we turn the other way around, who can say he or she is in favor of exclusion or discrimination? Um, so I decided to um, uh, investigate the terminology of inclusion in public policy because while inclusion seems to be taken for granted, discrimination persists. And this tension is even more salient in a context where inclusion is increasingly highlighted in political discourses. So everyone, every institution wants to be inclusive, uh, but the society in which we live and the cities in which we live remain spaces of, of exclusion and discrimination. So we can ask ourselves what lies behind the term inclusion and the uh, terminology of in inclusive city in public policy. Mm -hmm. What was left um, out there in the research specifically that prompted you to go ahead with this with this research? Um, so um, I was quite frustrated um, by the resources I found in the literature on the use of the inclusive city in gender related public policies. Um, I found institutional documents uh, from various bodies and, and also um, a lot of academic papers that were outlining the need to include women's need in public policy mostly. Um, and then um, for me, there was kind of challenges in this literature and I identified three of them. And the first was uh, about to trace some elements of genealogy of the term of inclusion in relation to gender. The second was um, to identify at what level of governance this term was used or was not used. And the third one, uh, which was for me the main one, was to adopt a definition of gender that would go beyond an egalitarian framework for women and would include as well people who do not conform with heteronormativity. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, promising. So let us know the most important highlights of your study. Um, so this this paper uh, is, um, is more um, a theoretical paper and then analyzed more specifically two areas of public policy. Uh, so women's equality and LGBTQ plus equality. Um, and the joint analysis of these two fields um, highlights similarities in the paradoxical integration of uh, women and LGBTQ plus equality agendas in public policies. So I identified three main shared patterns. Um, first is that there is a focus on tools and procedures that runs the risk of being disconnected from an overall strategy of equality and also from the diversity of lead experiences. And um, this leads to forms of technocratization that prevent transformative change. For example, um, this is the case when um, the accessibility of public space is advanced by means of statistical indicators rather than through a critical analysis of the power dynamics that prevent women and gender and sexual minorities of a full participation to the public realm. So that's the first pattern. And I identified a second pattern, um, which is linked to the genesis of inclusion policies. Um, so both in gender as women and LGBTQ plus equality policies, um, both agendas remain economically driven. Um, the project of inclusion is primarily a project of integration into the market, uh, and therefore social inclusion serves to promote what should an emancipatory lifestyle be like based on consumption lifestyle. So this issue is also linked to the definition of the public targeted by inclusion policies, uh, namely a citizen who participates in the markets through consumption practices, and this limits the public of most inclusion policies to middle class subjects, who are also most often um, white able cis subjects. 
And um, finally, the third shared burden identified is that um, there remains um, an, an ethnocentric binary thinking within most public policies that contributes to present Europe on one part as an ideal model of tolerance and openness to gender and sexual diversity. Um, and you, these equality policies portray then um, an ideal model of citizenship uh, who is economically independent and socially emancipated in opposition to the figure of a non-Western other portrayed as illiberal and backwards and in need of education in terms of gender equality towards progress and modernity. Um, so as a wrap up on the outcomes, the um, inclusive city appears more as a desirable ideal for cities than as an operational mode of governance. And it has become um, a kind of normative framework for virtuous urban development based on consumption lifestyles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this links a bit that I, I, I would like to in the beginning when you said that we all say, we like to say that we're all inclusive, but we still find a lot of exclusion uh, spaces in cities. So being this more of a theoretical paper, and you've highlighted as the, the three main conclusions, what can you tell us about consequences for public policies? Um, well, um, I think that if we draw on this idea of the inclusive city as an ideal and normative framework for urban development, it's worth asking um, whether it has not become more of a buzzword uh, that eludes power relations. Um, to illustrate this, we can highlight how the inclusive city model refrains itself from challenging the heteronormative structures that produce inequalities, um, and um, also underline how heteronormativity and capitalism remain closely linked one to each other. So for the inclusive city to uh, overcome the drifts of neoliberal governance and reach its democratic potential, there is a need to work with a reorientation of planning. Mm -hmm. um, this means not only recognizing LGBTQ plus subjects, but rather placing them as central to the making of a more inclusive city. And this could be done, for instance, by working more closely with grassroots movements and through participative action research methodologies. Mm -hmm. And academically, what are some venues for future research? Um, so as this is more um, a theoretical insight on the issues of inclusion and the inclusive city, I would say that now um, um, there is a need to confront this with empirical data. And to do this, right. um, and maybe drawing on a more like, would say, insurgent perspectives, um, I would call for a focus on participatory action research with grassroots organization, mm -hmm. with the aim of um, leading to the opening of um, more queer creative futures. So this is what I will be following in my um, forthcoming research project. We will be starting next spring on urban specialities and senses of belonging of queer exiles with participatory action research uh, methodologies. Perfect. Um, Karin, this has been a very straight to the point episode. Uh, but if someone just came into this conversation and didn't listen to what you said before, if you could sum up this conversation in one, two sentences, the punchline, what would it be? Um, so I would say that it's important to remember that um, inclusion and exclusion um, go always uh, one with each other. So it's important to uh, remember that inclusion um, is more like an ideal which is complicated to reach. Uh, so it has always to be uh, reassessed permanently. And also maybe if I, you know, me to add something more, uh, it's important to remember that inclusion and the inclusive city, it's not, on, not only about statistics, but about challenging and thinking to destabilize uh, the power relations um, that produce inequalities and then to uh, advance the empowerment of those uh, who are still marginalized. Karin, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to you. Uh, to those who are watching us on YouTube, you can find all the resources, all the materials of this conversation. Uh, of course, specifically the article that served as base for the conversation on the Let's Talk About Social Inclusion website. Alternatively, you can listen to this episode wherever you get your podcast. You can subscribe to our newsletter and follow us at on Twitter at Cogitatio LTA.